in trying to figure out how music helps to restore a sense of calm in the body very quickly or helps us change states, you know, we ended up figuring out that music doesn't have to be delivered to your ears to work. It actually can be delivered to your skin and to your body. And I'm wearing Apollo on my chest, you're wearing it on your wrist. You know, case in point, it doesn't really matter where the vibration comes in. It matters that we feel it and that it is at a rhythm that is pleasurable. Welcome to the Brain Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Patrick Porter. Please join us on our mission to better a billion brains. Enjoy the episode and remember to share it with your family and friends. Hey, Brain Tap Nation, Dr. Patrick Porter here, and I have with me a neuroscientist, double board certified psychiatrist. He's a high tech entrepreneur, he's an inventor. He's actually the medical officer and co-founder of Apollo, and I've been using it. So we're going to get to delve a little bit deeper into this technology. Who I'm talking about is Dr. David Rabin. And uh, Dr. Dave, tell us a little bit about your journey. You know, most people would think that being a psychiatrist and, and that you wouldn't get into tech. You know, you're using tech tech assisted. I'm I'm all for that. I'm a psychologist. So there's a lot of positive things happening. But tell us a little bit about your journey and why you created this technology. Yeah, happy to. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you, Patrick. I know we've been trying to get together to do this for quite a while. Um, and I really appreciate your work with BrainTap. It's a very interesting technology. And there's a lot of overlap between the work that we're doing with Apollo and helping people access more presentness, more um, mindful states of consciousness that are similar to what you're doing with BrainTap. And we need more tools. Um, and I think ultimately the you know, I am a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist, and I've been studying folks with treatment-resistant mental illness for many years and studying chronic stress for even more years, probably close to 20 years now, and just trying to figure out, you know, why do some of us ex experience very significant challenges in our lives and ultimately grow from those challenges and become better and stronger adapters and better versions of ourselves? And why do other, other times those similar challenges or um, or challenges that are even less than than the other challenges make it hard for us to succeed and and hold us back and sometimes even make us sick. And this has always interested me. And so I started looking at folks who were failing treatment effectively in mental health, people with PTSD and depression that were just not getting better with our current standard of care and trying to figure out any other tools that we could use that could help. And as you start to dive down that rabbit hole of how does the body work? What are the signs and signatures of, of this whole th system when we're sick and when we're well? And wh what can we measure and what can we not measure? And how do we develop better understanding of how the body works uh, in these different states? What we realized is that through the study of all of this stuff at the University of Pittsburgh, particularly between 2013 and 2018, um, we realized that we can tap into the body's natural sense of safety using tools that uh, that we don't have yet. And some of those tools are effectively the tools that come from ancient medical tradition. So things like movement, breathing, soothing touch, soothing movement, uh, soothing music, and uh, things like sleep and nutrition. And when you really circle around all of those things and you optimize at each of those levels, we start to retrain and recondition the body to function at a much higher level. And so this really fascinated me and then led me down the path of studying technology and psychedelic medicines because we're just trying to find better tools. And there's early a lot of early evidence now to suggest that those tools can work really well to help us solve some really hard problems. Yeah, this is awesome because uh, I'm on a mission. I work a lot with Ames India, the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, because we're always looking at ancient traditions and modern science. And really all we're doing is we're recreating these ancient traditions because they already knew what worked, like plant medicine, for instance, or or using, in your case, music, is, which is at the roots of what uh, what you're doing at Apollo. And I know there's something called the Mozart effect that they found out that the body, the brain just works better in certain environments. And a lot of people don't understand that our body is adapting every 40 seconds to its environment on a genetic level. So that safety feature or profile, tell us a little bit about how this music played into, you know, this Apollo system, because when I feel it, you know, I, I said it, I've done all the different tracks or whatever, but I also have it set up so that during the day, I know when my biological lows are, because I can measure my biorhythm with a piece of equipment we have. So I set it to see if I could adjust that and get my biological lows not to be so low and just playing around with it, you know, because that's 
the kind of brain I have. But the, um, you know, tell us a little bit about how music played into that and how music can be more therapeutic, because I know it, but I, I don't think our listeners understand it. For sure. Um, and this is really what drove us to study this stuff, because we were in addition to being mental health providers and and neuroscience researchers and psychologists, psychiatrists, we all had musical backgrounds in our initial uh, research team. And so that uh, experiencing the positive soothing effects of music and the joyful in joy inducing effects of music and seeing music work in therapy to help our patients were all things that were resonant with us and really helped us to understand intuitively what it felt like to have music help us access a different state. Um, even just sitting in your car on a bad day or a hard day when your favorite song comes on the radio and stuck in traffic, right? We all know that that feels, makes us feel better. And so we really wanted to figure that out and how that, and figure out how that works. And ultimately Apollo came out of that work because in trying to figure out how music helps to restore a sense of calm in the body very quickly, or helps to change helps us change states. Um, you know, we ended up figuring out that music doesn't have to be delivered to your ears to work. It actually can be delivered to your skin and to your body. And I'm wearing Apollo on my chest. You're wearing it on your wrist. You know, case in point, it doesn't really matter where the vibration comes in. It matters that we feel it and that it and that it is at a rhythm that is pleasurable or joy or joy inducing or soothing. And it turns out that when we, what we figured out in the lab between 2013 and 2018 at the University of Pittsburgh is that when you, if you understand the rhythms that music has that induce the sense of calm and, or increased focus or increased sleep or meditation, et cetera, and then you take those rhythms and you distill them down to their simplest parts and you send them to the skin or to the body, anywhere on the body, that the body will actually re respond to them the same as music that we hear. And that we don't need to hear it to actually get the benefits. And so that's where all of this started. And then we realized that over time, as we tested that in the lab, that we could induce these similar states and you could measure it with like heart rate monitors and brainwave monitors and respiratory monitors. And there were lots of ways to measure somebody under stress and somebody when you fix that stress and get them into a better state using tools like Apollo. And so in short, Apollo is basically music for the body that we developed uh, with a team of neuroscientists and physicians at the university. And it works by sending soothing vibrations to your body that improve sleep, focus, energy, and reduce stress. Um, and, you know, many of our customers say it gives them the benefits of meditation or breath work, but they can use it any time and they, and they don't have to master breath work to access those feelings. But then as they feel what they feel from Apollo, it helps them learn how to access those states of, of, deep breathing and meditation mindfulness more easily because they know what they're aiming for, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Uh, yeah, people have found that, uh, you know, the body, just like the neurophone, which was the first invention of bone conduction, that you hear all over the body. I mean, the there's so, the body, every cell has these chromoforms that, that gathers energy and, and produces results and also changes our our epigenetic profile, our genetic profile. So if we can create an environment, it doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. So if you can create the environment there on a mountaintop or they're sitting near a river and the frequencies are there, the, the body, we interpret the frequencies of light, sound and vibration into what we see as forms. But the reality is that our body is still interpreting it as frequencies. So you, this frequency medicine, and one of the things that I thought was amazing, because there's failure to thrive, right, with children if they don't get touched, right? There's study after study. And so they would actually hire the nurses to, or tell the nurses, hey, every once in a while, just go in there and touch the babies, because it made a big difference. And you found that to be true. And that's kind of behind the science. So tell us a little bit about how physical touch helps to regulate hormones and like like cortisol. I mean, because if you if you feel abandoned, you're not you don't feel like you're in the community. We all know the community's big part, like the blue zone uh, theories and things like that that we have. If you don't feel like you're part of something, then your body will start to create that cortisol, neoprenephrine, and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> dopamine, and all those things that are bad. You're going <laughs> to dysregulate the brain. So tell us a little bit about what's happening there. For sure. So so that's a great point, right? And I think the I, the main thing that we're talking about when we talk about um, people, you know, struggling to overcome challenge in their lives or being stressed out is the perception of threat and whether threat is real, meaning 
we are actually running out of food or water or air or actually being chased by a predator or actually being excluded from our community or losing purpose, right? Those are kind of the real threats for us and then that are actually potentially survival threats. And then there's everything else, like too many emails, too much traffic, late for work, too many responsibilities, too much phone news, et cetera, right? And all of that is perceived threat. It's threat that we be, it's things we believe or have been trained to believe are threatening to us potentially because they're setting off that same response in our bodies of fight or flight, but they're not actually survival threats. And so the core of mindfulness practice, whether you're learning it from an Eastern, Western, or tribal tradition, which includes the practices of somatic training, so body training, body first to brain, um, mindfulness is brain to body right? As we call top down and bottom up experiential learning is body to brain. So helping you learn to feel certain ways in your body using soothing touch doesn't require words or any other understanding. And it rapidly taps into a hardwired neural pathway in our bodies that has existed for hundreds of millions of years, going back to the oldest mammals and all mammals that at least almost all mammals that I know of going back hundreds of millions of years, have nursed their young as soon as they're born, right? And the first thing that happens after, especially in primates, after a newborn uh, is emerges and they are separated from the mother's womb is that they climb on top of the mother and they form an instant nonverbal bond. And that bond is through touch. And that soothing touch, whether it's through nursing, breastfeeding, or through just, you know, mother and baby being close together when the baby can't be comforted in any other way because it doesn't have an understanding of what's going on, but it knows it has a lot less safety than it did when it was in, in the womb, right? There's that nonverbal touch communication that activates a sense of safety immediately in children. And this is why when our children are screaming and crying at night in bed and they're alone, and if you go up to them and you, and you, you know, hold them and, and, you know, swaddle them or cuddle them that you, even just for a little while, you can get them to calm down usually relatively quickly because that soothing touch just rapidly sends safety signals to the body that help us to remember that if we can feel soothed in this current state, we can't possibly be in immediate danger. And that has a, like a nervous system wide effect that reduces heart rate, reduces blood pressure, increases heart rate variability, and reduces uh, inflammation throughout the entire body and allows us to redirect all our blood flow to the organ systems that we care about, like the rest and digest systems and the recovery and the reproductive systems and the immune system and the uh, empathy and creative creativity systems, all those things we want to get attention and to get energy when we're not under threat. So as my wife likes to say, the C Catherine, the CEO of Apollo, you know, we're all like big babies. And even as adults, we still crave and, and need that soothing touch because that soothing touch induces the release of all the neurotransmitters that we like when we take drugs, right? So soothing touch increases the release of endogenous opioids that are natural pain relieving molecules, endogenous cannabinoids, natural emotion regulating and mood regulating, anxiety regulating molecules. And then of course, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, bonding molecules, reward molecules, meaning making molecules, and more. So if we're not getting soothing touch in our environment, like social distancing created a lot of problems for that when during the last three years of, of the pandemic, then what do we see in the community as expected? Well, we see an increase in people abusing drugs that are activating those same receptor systems that soothing touch activates, right? So it's not hard to predict what's gonna happen when people lose access to their natural ways to soothe and heal. So that's a big focus for us is how do we help remind people that they can get a lot of those benefits naturally on the go. Yeah, what I like about it, uh, as I've been using it, if I know I'm gonna go into a meeting, you can set it to basically give you an unfair advantage, even though you're in a meeting where you would be, uh, maybe you need a little stress to react, but you don't want to be so stressed that you can't think, you know, so you can put this on and kind of a gentle reminder. And um, I, I love stimulus, so mine's probably a little higher than most, but the, um, uh, and maybe I didn't get enough love when I was a kid or something, but the, uh, in, in the process, but, I, the club. but I've been <laughs> preaching to people is that, we have a physiological problem 
just as much as we have a mental health problem. You know, people are so disconnected from their bodies now. And uh, I mean, there's so much going on. So when you think about the health practitioners that might be listening here today, what do you think about the health practitioners such as yourself in, in how they could work with this new touch? Because it, it almost seems like uh, touch is being taboo now. You know, you can't touch people. My daughter, I remember in, in high school, because we're a hugger family. I wasn't growing up. You know, we were a good Catholic family and we just, you know, we knew we were loved. We didn't hear it. You know, we didn't feel it. But then as I got older and, and going into therapy and learning about it, my kids, I made sure I hugged them a lot. And my daughter got in trouble because she had boundary issues because she would she would be hugging people. She's very kinesthetic, you know, in uh, so tell us, how do you think it's going to affect mental health practitioners? And what do you, is if your advice being, being one of the leading thought leaders in this field, what would you recommend they do? <clears throat> yes, it's, it's also a really good question. You know, I think that when we think about delivering care as care providers, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, a therapist, social worker, psychologist, et cetera, or you're a surgeon or family medicine practitioner, the single biggest thing that we see as a factor that impacts people's ability to engage in treatment, participate in treatment meaningfully, and get to recovery successfully with minimal complications is feeling safe with their clinical provider, right? So when you, if you went to the doctor for something and you were, it took you a while maybe to get there because you're not feeling good and it didn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily feel good to admit that you're not feeling good right? And you're not, we're not used to that. We're not trained to talk about being vulnerable. And then you finally make it to the doctor and you feel like your doctor or your, or your clinician is judging you in some way, or that they don't have enough time to listen to you, which is the most common thing because they're rushing to get from client to client. Is that going to make you feel like you want to tell them what's really going on? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Right. And so what we, what is imperative in the field right now is more than just it's more, much more than just bringing touch back in, it's bringing safety back in and to the clinical environment and remembering that as doctors, as clinicians, we are, our single most important goal is to number one, build a team with our patients, with our clients as an alliance. It's called the physician or clinician patient alliance so that everybody knows we're on the same team and we have the same goals and we're not going to force medication or force treatment on you. We're going to help you understand what your goals are and then give you a couple different paths to get there that work best for you that help you feel safe and in control of the healing experience and remind you how to take that into your own hands. And once you get to that point, and why Apollo is so interesting is because many of us as clinicians and have been sort of brought into this culture right now where medicine is being thought of as a lot, very much as a business and a lot of doctors and caregivers are being treated like factory workers. The time to give that kind of care and team alliance building and trust with our clients and our patients is diminishing dramatically, right? We have less and less time for our clients. And so how do we how do we take the time to give people some of that stuff in the office so that they feel safer coming in? They feel safer being vulnerable with us. They feel safer communicating what's actually going on so that we can help them more effectively achieve their goals. So that's the in office part and that Apollo and other and wearables that, that activate the touch receptor system can help with. But I think what's really unique about Apollo that's interesting is it gives people, and why we created it in large part is it gives us as clinicians a tool, not only that we can use on ourselves to help us stay calm and at our best in in before, during, and after working with patients in stressful situations, and but it also helps our clients have a tool they can take out of the office, right? So similar to what you're talking about with when you talk about brain tap, right? There, we need more tools to give our patients and clients so that when in between our visits, they can still keep doing the work and the work is fun and it's engaging and it's something that they want to participate in. And, you know, I see brain tap as being this great tool that people can learn to feel what it feels like to do really advanced sitting meditations with. And then Apollo is a tool that can amplify those meditations as Ben Greenfield talks about a lot. He is a huge fan of combining both these tools, but then if you even, but then you can also use Apollo on the go passively in the background. It doesn't require you to sit and do something specific you can just strap it on. You can set it to, Hey, I want, I need to give a talk right now, or I need to, you know, see, uh, go for a run right now, or I need to get some sleep right now or meditate. 
and it will nudge you into that state. And it doesn't re- like a song, it doesn't require you to attend to it. You can set it and forget it. And I think that type of tool is critical for our clients to have because they don't have time or energy to do a lot of extra work as it is. So the more that we can give them passive tools that continue the work while they're at home, whether you're talking about ketamine therapy or you're talking about regular psychotherapy or regular family medicine and family health lifestyle medicine, we need more tools to keep our patients feeling good, engaged, and knowing, giving them that reminder, that target of this is where I'm aiming on my health journey, right? And so Apollo is a really great tool that helps facilitate that through the sense of touch that can be used passively in the background and complements some of the other tools that we talk about. Yeah, I think that's great. And I'm going to, I want to get into a little bit about psychedelics in a moment, but I have one more question or kind of a conversation piece. I know that a lot of people have issues with like 5G and what's going on and they don't realize that they're getting vibratory frequencies, 50 million pulses per second on those cells. So our cells are trying to interpret that and they might have this underground stress. I'm wondering if you've ever looked at uh, because there's like with hearing, we have first and second attention, right? And if we have the Apollo on, that becomes first attention to our receptor sites instead of the external world controlling what's going on. Have you ever thought about that in any way? Or Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore control over your primary attention, which is our single most powerful resource as human beings. Effectively, what we choose to put our attention on is what is allowed to enter into our awareness and is allowed to enter into our consciousness and therefore becomes part of us. So the more time we spend attending to anything, whether that's something that we chose to pay attention to or something that we didn't choose to pay attention to, we're still letting it in, right? It's still coming into our awareness and becoming part of us. So we want to make sure that when we pay attention to anything, that we're doing it thoughtfully and we're doing it consciously and intentionally because ultimately thoughts can be like vampires. And if we allow ourselves to pay attention, and this is my favorite metaphor for thoughts that that don't serve us, if we allow ourselves to attend to thoughts from the environment or thoughts from inside of ourselves that are not serving us right now in this moment, then we're giving our power away. We're giving our attention away. And, you know, we, to, to really practice self-gratitude at its core, we have to remember to be grateful for controlling our attention and for being intentional or thoughtful about our attention. So Apollo is a tool that trains that and it reminds us by training self-awareness to say, hey, you know, if you're calm, you have a lot more decisions that you could put or a lot more opportunity that you can possibly choose from. But when we're in a hype, you know, hyper stressed out, chronic stress state, we get tunnel vision, right? And then we miss everything that's out here. We're just stuck here trying to get out of the situation we're in. And we know that's what that's what fight or flight does to us. This has been studied for hundreds of years. So I think the opportunity there is how do you create anchors that bring us back into the body? Because bring our bodies are always present. Our bodies are always in the here and now. And our heads can be anywhere. So how do we help people remember what it feels like to be embodied, to be in their body, to feel that feeling, and then to know that you can aim for that feeling by doing other things in your life that are natural that help you get there. And Apollo is uh, helpful because it almost is like a noise canceling tool for our bodies and our brains. So when you're on the go, by having it close to your body, even through clothing, it works, it can effectively give you some of that noise canceling effect because you're tuning into this first and then you're evaluating everything else rather than just being sucked into the whatever it is that's going on in the environment around you. Right. So that's awesome. Now, I know one of your other passions is psychedelics. We kind of talked about that at the biohacking event a couple of years ago. And a lot of therapists are using this in mental health professionals. Tell us a little bit about the benefits and tell us how you combine the two, because I thought that was interesting how you can use it to enhance the experience and things of that nature. Yeah. So, so I think the most common, so let's start at the beginning, right? Because I think most people don't understand what psychedelic really means. So psychedelic is a word that was coined by uh, Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond in the 1950s when they were trying to figure out how to describe the phenomena that people experience in altered states that are induced by drugs like psilocybin and LSD and mescaline and, and MDMA, et cetera. And what we what they figured out was that these medicines are capable 
uh, uh, and they've come up with the best description that we've had so far, which is the word psychedelic, because these medicines are capable of revealing our subconscious mind to us for a certain amount of time or expanding our awareness molecularly as medicines expanding our awareness. And this is really interesting. And so the word psychedelic was chosen because psyche means mind and delos means to reveal or to show. So we're really talking about taking a medicine in the right environment that reveals our minds to us. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, so the reason why that's really important to understand is because when we reveal our minds to ourselves, we're revealing all of our minds to ourselves, right? We're revealing the stuff we're ashamed of and feel upset and guilty about and the stuff we've repressed. And we're also revealing the stuff that makes us feel really happy and joyful and excited and loving life. And all of those coexist all the time together. It's just, what are we paying attention to more or less? And, and how much of a role is each of those things playing? And usually that's trained. We've learned how to focus on the stuff that's unpleasant versus the stuff that's pleasant and to find our own balance. And so why, how does, how does Apollo tie in? Well, well, if psychedelic medicines increase awareness globally, meaning they increase awareness of both stuff that's uncomfortable and stuff that's comfortable, then when we give people psychedelic experiences in closed environments or clinical environments that are highly controlled, how do we help them feel safe enough to be able to go back and look at some of that uncomfortable stuff and then reevaluate it and try to understand it better. Because if you go in afraid, really afraid, then the medicine can amplify awareness of your fear, right? Just like it can amplify awareness of your, of your joy. And if you are amplifying awareness of your fear because you're not feeling safe in the environment and then stuff is coming up from the past to be processed like a past traumatic event or a challenging situation, then what are you going to say when you experience that and you're afraid? You're going to say, no, thanks, right? I would prefer to come back to that later. And we put up resistance and, and boundaries to it. And that is what actually results in a bad trip is resisting what comes or a bad trip or a challenging trip is when we resist what comes up for healing in the experience. And so the safety of the experience, meaning that team alliance I mentioned earlier, how you're working with somebody you can trust, who's not judging you. You can say anything you want to that person. You know, they're going to be there to support you and hold that safe container. And anything that comes up is just coming up for healing and it's you and it's okay. Then when you set that kind of frame, then the med going in before you act, the medicine's taken, then the medicine amplifies that safety. And it helps people, for example, in the case of MDMA therapy, to feel safe enough to reevaluate trauma that had happened to them that they have never felt safe enough to go back and consider reconsider before. And so Apollo was developed out of that understanding of how MDMA and different psychedelics work to amplify safety cascades in our emotional brain. Because when we, I did my MDMA training in, in 2016, I realized at trying to study the mechanism of it that, and we can get into the exciting epigenetics findings we just published recently as well, but what we found out from the work we were doing and the work of others is that MDMA amplifies safety pathways in the brain. If you don't feel safe, you're not going to get the same benefit. If you feel safe, you get tremendous benefit. And so that led us to study those pathways and to figure out that guess what? Soothing touch also activates those pathways. So when we started to study that, we were able to replicate in the lab at the university some of the benefits of MDMA therapy in terms of felt safety in your body just using soothing touch with vibration alone, just sound waves. And then once we were able to show that in the lab, we started making prototypes and sending them out to clinicians and they use them with their patients, with themselves. And we saw that they were getting better outcomes from their therapy experiences with medicine because it was amplifying that safety for their clients before, during, and after. And now Apollo is being used in collaboration with the MAPS trial for integration after MDMA therapy. And also, and it's the first wearable to be used in that environment. And it's also being used by a number of ketamine clinics and in ketamine trials around the country and in Canada. That's awesome. Now you can find out more at apolloneuro.com, but as, as people think about if this is for them, obviously anyone can benefit from it, but what have you seen as far as athletics or people who, you know, two thirds of the world isn't sleeping. So we have sleep deprived people. We have people who are parents. They didn't go to parent university and now they have children. They don't know exactly what to do. Uh, entrepreneurs, of course, they're 
their their own psychologists usually, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because they're so stressed out and they sometimes they manage that stress in inappropriate ways. Tell us a little bit about some of these areas and what what can how they can benefit from you know, really wearing the Apollo and and getting the results. For sure. And when we first started working on Apollo, we were, again, as I mentioned, we were developing it for folks with PTSD because that was the biggest problem that we saw we were trying to solve. Then fast forward, we made, you know, hundreds of prototypes we distributed to thousands of people over two years. And what we found was that ourselves, our friends and family, our colleagues who were working in the hospitals, et cetera, clinicians, we're all using it on themselves and having great benefit, even though they never had a diagnosis of PTSD or any kind of trauma disorder. Mm -hmm. So that became really interesting. And it was around that time in 2017, 2018, during those initial uh, prototype pilots of Apollo, where of the Apollo wearable in the real world, that we found that healthy, regular folks who were just really hardworking and very busy, mostly mothers with kids and working, were using Apollo and particularly using it for sleep. And that became really interesting to study. So we started evaluating that in inside and outside of clinical trials in observational trials with th thousands of people over the years. And we saw in fact that sleep and the res restoration and regulation of circadian rhythms without drugs is actually one of the single biggest benefits that people get. So what, what does that mean? Let's break it down to really simple terms. It means having stuff that's non-drug that helps you be awake when you want to be awake and feel rested and energized and then having things and tools that help you without drugs feel calm and sleepy and and able to wind down and go to bed when you want to and then wake up again when you want to without grogginess so it's those periods of the day they're going from sleepiness to wakefulness wakefulness to work work to meditation uh you know work to breaks, et cetera, and then back to sleep again, that create the biggest challenges for us throughout the day. And so what we've seen that people, when people start to use Apollo in the short term, they can notice benefits in as little as a day to two weeks that are very substantial in terms of the way they feel. But most people who are using Apollo get the best benefits around three months. And what we've seen around three months is that if you use Apollo consistently throughout the day, giving yourself a little bit of that soothing touch for about three hours a day, which you can schedule it. You can set it and forget it. it. just runs in the background, no phone needed. You can turn off all the radios if you're EMF sensitive and you can use it and just run it throughout the day. And it program, it regulates your whole circadian cycle. It wakes you up. It keeps you focused and energized in the morning, keeps you creative and focused in the afternoon, helps you recover after workouts. It boosts your heart rate variability. And we've seen that um, very significantly in the short term after workouts or after cognitive stress, and then it helps put you to bed. And as you do that over three months, we've seen on average 19% more deep sleep, 14% more REM sleep, up to 30 minutes more sleep a night. That is less light sleep and more deep in REM. And we've seen 4% average reductions in resting heart rate and up to an 11% average increases in heart rate variability. So to give everybody an idea of how significant those findings are, that's comparable to, that's again, people tracked, 1,500 people tracked over three years. That is a comparable amount of improvement to what we see with three months of adopting a new exercise, mindfulness, or yoga routine. So, And they're all targeting the same systems of our bodies. So it's really going to show that by giving us a little bit more balance in our bodies that we can, using technological tools, we can start to nudge ourselves into these states that promote healing and recovery, similar to yoga, exercise, and mindfulness. And when we feel better, we're actually more likely to do those things and engage in those activities also. That's excellent. Well, this has been very informative. We're just wrapping up on this, this uh, podcast today, but how can people find out more about you and what's going on and where you're headed. I know that we're going to put the social media links in. Is there any special place you think is more valuable than others or uh, to find out and follow you because you're doing a lot of exciting things out there in the world? Oh, thank you. I mean, I think, you know, please check me out on socials. I love to hear from you at Dr. David Rabin on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I think the, for people who are interested in this work, one of the most exciting places you can go to get on, get to the forefront of the movement is on our show, The Psychedelic Report, which is 
the first psychedelic news show that is hosted by clinicians and researchers who are actually doing work in the field. And we bring the latest of what's going on in the psychedelic space and technology and consciousness work um, every two weeks on uh, Apple and uh, Spotify. And you could find that at the psychedelicreport.com. And then the other show that's interesting that we just released as a special feature for Matt, uh, for Psychedelic Science 2023 is called Your Brain Explained. And you can find that at yourbrainexplained.co, also on Spotify and Apple. And this is a show where we just really, it just comes out quarterly as a special feature. And it's where we break down some of these really complex topics about how does technology work to alter states of consciousness? How does MDMA assisted therapy work to heal people with PTSD? How does this, how does this help us rethink the paradigm of mental illness and healing? Uh, and how does this shape the way we move forward in the treatment and understanding of mental health? Um, and that first episode just came out last week. So we're really excited to share it with everybody. And that'll give you the deep dive into all of this work. And, and I think just one lot, do you mind if I add one thing about the epigenetic oh, story? Yeah. Because yeah. because you mentioned, I want people to really understand the the um, gravity of this work and how exciting this epigenetic story is. So what epigenetics mean, as most of your audience knows, is it's the code that's on top of our DNA that tells our DNA to turn certain parts of it up or down. And this is how our stress response genes are regulated. And all of our genes in our whole body are basically regulated by this epigenetic mechanism, which helps, which is kind of like the recording of on our DNA, the impact of the environment, as you were saying. So as we, when we, the DNA is, is, uh, nature and the environment is nurture. So the, where do they interface? They interface in the epigenetic code, which tells which parts of the DNA to turn up and down based on the environment that we experience what we learn. So that is really important to understand because Dr. Rachel Yehuda over the last 30 years and many others now have shown that traumatic events cause changes to cortisol gene expression and cortisol receptor expression that increase our, our likelihood and our offspring's likelihood of developing disorders like PTSD and depression and other mental illnesses. So if we can understand that better and understand that trauma, which is like one or multiple intense, meaningful experiences we perceive as threatening over time for which we did not receive adequate support after can cause these epigenetic changes to our cortisol receptor genes that increase our likelihood of mental illness and possibly physical illness. And then we can pass those down to our offspring. Then MDMA assisted therapy in the MAPS trial looks like it's reversing that response, right? With just three doses of medicine and 12 weeks of psychotherapy over with 42 hours of therapy, we're actually seeing an 88% response rate in the phase three, phase three trials with a 67% one year remission rate at in the phase two trial. So this is really paradigm shifting and groundbreaking for the psychiatry field because we've never had tools that work this well in such a short amount of time to treat people who have never had gotten better with any other treatments. So that in and of itself is exciting, but we wanted to find out, well, how is that working on the epigenetic level, right? If trauma is causing these changes to cortisol receptor expression, and then MDMA therapy with 42 hours of treatment is seems to be clinically acting like a reverse trauma, meaning that people's symptoms get better over time and they continue to get better even after the treatment stopped, then is it possible that MDMA-assisted therapy might be able to reverse the epigenetic changes on the cortisol receptor genes and make those receptors function the, back to the way they're supposed to pre-trauma? And we just published this paper, it took five and a half years. It's collaboration between uh, myself, uh, Ben Kalmendi at Yale, Rachel Yehuda at Sinai, MAPS team, and uh, Joe Tafur and Rael Khan at USC. And what we found out was that our theory was actually correct, which is that when you look at the DNA expression of cortisol on the cortisol receptor before and after 12 weeks of MDMA and three doses, what we see is that MDMA assisted therapy is actually reversing these tra trauma induced methylation patterns on the cortisol receptor, which are in a, in a way that is directly proportionate to the amount that they get better. So the more people get better and the more they respond positively to the MDMA experience, the more 
change in methylation they have at this cortisol receptor site. So now we have a clue that there's a link directly between how do people respond to the healing experience, how much are they likely to respond, and what does healing look like on the DNA level when people get through to the other side. So then we can start to predict outcomes and we can start to predict how healing is actually working and how we track it more effectively, which we have not been able to do to this date. And to, and to take it full circle, we have a study that's very, very exciting going on right now at the Denver VA, where we're replicating that same 12-week protocol with vets with PTSD, with MDMA, with Apollo alone. And so we're measuring their epigenetic markers before and after 12 weeks of Apollo-only use. And we're going to see, is do, do we also get cortisol, regime, cortisol receptor modification at the methylation site? Because if so, what it will show is that it's not the drug, right? The drug is the tool that helps us amplify access to certain states of safety, but you might be able to get access to those states of safety with lots of, lots of other ways like soothing touch. And if Apollo can increase so, or induce similar changes in people clinically, they're getting better. We see people with PTSD responding to Apollo in ways that are similar to MDMA therapy. Can you measure it on the DNA? And if we can in the same sites, then perhaps we actually have clues for the very first time into the biological and genetic and epigenetic mechanisms of healing all the way down from the top to the bottom of the cells. That's great. Well, congratulations. I know that we're really big. We think the future is light, sound, and vibration therapy. And I think that these psychedelics done correctly with proper supervision, I think are going to be incredible tools for people to access them. Uh, and if we, like you said, if they're safe, they're going to have a better experience and it's going to help them. So this has been a wonderful conversation. I love talking to you. I think you could probably talk for a couple of days and, and give us really valuable information. So we'll see what we can do. I'd love to, when that study comes back, if it's positive, I would love to share that with the community because we're, we're really big on helping the vets as well. So anything we can do to bring to the veteran community, they've given so much for us. And they basically just kick to the curb once they're done and, and not being serviced the way that they, they could be. So this is exciting information and you're on the cutting edge. So I'm going to encourage everyone listening to this, like, share, tell everyone, you know, about this technology, this Apollo technology, because it's something they, it's not expensive. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's very inexpensive and you can like he said, tune yourself up. I mean, you can tune yourself to go to sleep. You can tune yourself to uh, be more productive in your sport. You can, there's so many different applications. I mean, in those seven frequencies and, and how you have them working. So go check it out at, a, at apolloneuro.com and uh, follow Dr. Dave. And we're going to have all those things, all that in the, in the show notes. And, um, Hopefully we'll be able to also pull those research documents. Maybe we'll put those in there for people because some people, you know, they won't want to go themselves, but we can put a link in there if it's free. Uh, you know, I'll go check them out because I have access to some of those things. So, so we'll go see it, but thanks a lot for being here. Any, any pet parting message that you want to leave with the brain tap listeners before we end the call? Well, first off, just thank you so much for having me. Um, anybody who's interested in Apollo can check it out at apolloneuro.com or wearablehugs.com, which is what the kids call it. Um, and I think the main thing that I want to leave everybody with, which we often overlook, is, is that you know what we do and what we think about and the way we the way we behave actually matters. And and we often are ready and willing to be kind and supportive to other people before we are kind to ourselves. But if we don't sh take the time to be kind to ourselves and show love to ourselves and gratitude to ourselves and forgiveness and compassion to ourselves, then our ability to show those things truly to others without resentment or without feeling bad about it later uh, is very slim. It's very hard to do that when we are not feeding ourselves and refilling our own tank. And I think that you know, one of the things that we're talking about here when we talk about healing with light, sound, and vibration is healing through physics, right? right. Physics was the way that we used to heal people back 50, 70, 80 years ago, right? This was the major way that we healed people in medicine. And then we entered the chemical era where we're only using molecules or predominantly using molecules. And we forgot a lot about the power of physical energy to heal the body. 
And physical energy is also in the form of us expressing kindness to one another because that creates energetic ripples that extend out through out from us to everyone else around us. And it starts with showing that to ourselves. So ultimately, chemistry is very important. We love as physicians and doctors, we love to use chemistry to help people heal and it can work very well, but chemistry has a lot of challenges. It's hard to access. It has side effects. It can be addictive and and cause harm. And so for us, thinking about where we're going in the modern paradigm of medicine, thinking about going back to a paradigm where we can have chemistry in our toolbox, we can have molecules and medicines, and we can also, that are both plant and synthetic, and we can have mechanical tools that deliver sound, vibration, light, and other frequencies to the body that help non-invasively without side effects restore calm to the body and remind us that we're in control is really the sweet spot and the holy grail of healing. You know, that's how, what we want. It's not about one or the other. It's not about black and white. It's about how do we take all the knowledge we've accumulated over the last 10,000 years as a human species from Eastern, Western, and tribal culture and technology and AI and bring it all together into one, you know, cohesive, holistic way to approach medicine. And, and that starts again with being kind to ourselves and making sure that we re- we do our work and and help ourselves feel safe and present in our own bodies. And the more that we do that, even just to ourselves, the more that that will radiate out to everyone else around us. Very well said. And I think we can end on that. So again, continue to follow us here at the the Brain Fitness Podcast. We're out to better a billion brains. And, and Dr. Dave, you're out there doing the same thing. Uh, we believe the physiology and psychology are matched. If they're not together, there'll be a disconnection and disharmony. So please, again, like and share this. Go check out ApolloNeuro.com. I can't reg- recommend it any higher than what I'm doing. I'm using it. Uh, it's a great technology. If you follow Ben Greenfield, he's using it. He usually tests everything. He's one of he's a friend of BrainTap as well. So as you as you work, you'll see it out there. People using it in their everyday life as well as their professional life. So this is something fun, but it's also healthy. So again, tune in to the next Brain Fitness Podcast. We'll have more ways to upgrade your brain and your body to help you to live your best life now. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on our mission to better a billion brains. Follow at Dr. Patrick Porter on social media for updates and remember to practice brain fitness every day.